Thank you very much for attending today and thanks very much for your interest in the Atlas project. Um, I want to first start off by introducing Kaylin to you. Uh, many of you will already know Kaylin. She's been um, the point of contact for the project for um, close to oh, over a year now and um, is, uh, works very hard with the regional coordinators and um, is sort of well known to them. She uh, was introduced to birding through bird research as a wildlife technician during her undergraduate years and then got hooked on birding and decided to follow uh, up with a master's degree of, uh, in biology at Western University. Uh, she's now the assistant coordinator for the Atlas and uh, feels extremely fortunate to work alongside dedicated volunteers, collaborators and staff towards a shared goal of bird conservation. I just wanna say that she's done a wonderful job of organizing all of this weekend's activities and I wanna thank her very much for doing that. Thanks. Okay, my second job is to introduce Gregor Beck. Uh, Gregor is a wildlife biologist and conservation professional with over 30 years in the field. He's an avid birder and a naturalist and has directed conservation programs for Ontario Nature, the Quebec Labrador Foundation, Long Point Basin Land Trust, and Birds Canada. Gregor was a participant in the first atlas and was deeply involved in the second atlas as the chair of the management committee and is actively involved again in the third atlas where he is once again serving as the chair of the management committee. He currently leads Birds Canada's Boreal Conservation and Ontario programs. And I should also mention that Gregor took the lead on producing the Atlas II book that many of you are familiar with and he's largely responsible for what a beautiful publication that is. So I'm gonna hand things over to Gregor. I'm gonna share my screen and show some slides while, while Gregor's um, welcoming you. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Mike, and thank you, Kaylin. How's the sound, okay? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mike and Kaylin. I am a program director with Birds Canada, but I am here today very proudly on behalf of the five partners sponsoring this third Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas project. The same five groups that led the second atlas have joined together again, and we have rekindled the incredibly positive and successful spirit of cooperation for the new atlas. So on behalf of Birds Canada, Canadian Wildlife Service, Ontario Field Ornithologists, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, and Ontario Nature, I welcome everyone to the official, albeit virtual, launch of OBBA3. It's great to be here today with hundreds of friends and colleagues, a few relatives, I think, to celebrate this start of the new project. There is an incredible spirit to Atlas projects. There's a sense of purpose, excitement, determination, learning, and absolutely, there's a lot of fun about atlasing. For those among us who have participated in past atlases, we've been longing to get atlasing in Ontario again, well, since about 2005, when field work wrapped up with the second one. And for those of us who are new to atlasing, we know that you will be as excited and engaged as ourselves, or as any of the 3,400 volunteers who participated last time. That spirit is definitely catching on very well already since just so far, there are already 1,700 people formally registered with the project and more and more are joining all the time. Before we go further though, I would like to offer this land acknowledgement in recognition of the indigenous peoples and communities on whose lands this project will occur. I'm speaking today from Toronto. So my personal acknowledgement is in that context. Since we are unable to gather in person, I would like to acknowledge the land that I am situated on here now. This place is in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples. And it is the current territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit under the Toronto Purchase Treaty number 13, signed in 1805. Since the very beginning, Indigenous peoples have inhabited these lands, which are still home to diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We are grateful for the opportunity to gather on this territory, albeit only virtually at the moment, and we are grateful for the opportunity to work and live here. We commit ourselves to the work of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, and through this land acknowledgement, our intent is to honour and show gratitude 
to take, it's always taken care of these lands for over 10,000 years. And it is offered as a sign of respect and willingness to learn and heal. During the last atlas, 14 indigenous communities participated. We are hoping in this third atlas to welcome the participation and collaboration of a far greater number of indigenous communities. While the times are challenging right now with COVID-19, we have reached out to over 130 Indigenous communities across Ontario to introduce the project and welcome participation. And we have formed an Indigenous Engagement Committee to help us do it ever better. We hope that through birds and a shared love of nature, we can come together in a spirit of respect and reconciliation across Ontario. And I would welcome everyone to attend a special session hosted by our Indigenous Engagement Committee tomorrow at 2.30. On the weekend, we'll share much about atlasing, including a lot of practical information about methods and technology. In the decade and a half since the end of the second atlas, that technology has come a long way. And I know I've got a lot to learn about the new techniques. Atlasing at the simplest level is about birding and about reveling in the enjoyment of seeing birds during the breeding season with so many of them in spectacular plumages. There's, there's the excitement of a great find, perhaps a new breeding species for the area, or perhaps even the province if you're incredibly lucky uh, and skilled. There is the enjoyment of getting to know new birding locations or the surprises of what you might find in unlikely places. There's also the enjoyment of spending time outdoors and getting a bit of exercise while bird watching, something exceptionally dear in these times. Beyond the fun of birding itself or the time enjoyed in nature, atlasing is also of tremendous importance for conservation. Atlases are one of the biggest volunteer-based wildlife surveys around. Atlases are done with rigorous scientific protocols in place and carried out at regular intervals across large geographic regions like a province or state. Data are analyzed and mapped to give an incredibly precise picture of the state of bird populations. Results from new atlases can be compared to prior ones showing which species are doing well and which are not. With the second atlas, we saw how birds of prey, for example, were in many cases making a great comeback. But we also saw the precipitous decline of swallows, swifts, flycatchers, and other aerial insectivores. Those results have helped tremendously to inform conservation efforts. With this third atlas, we'll see even more precisely how our birds are doing province-wide. Our collective atlasing efforts make possible the maps, statistical analyses, and population estimates that will inform conservation for the coming decades. Before we get into the program in more detail, I would like to extend thanks to a number of people and groups. First, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the five partners for coming together once again and backing the third atlas. We worked incredibly well together for this second atlas and we're off on great footing for the third. To the growing number of financial supporters, we're very grateful. A big shout out to Environment and Climate Change Canada, Canadian Wildlife Service, Vortex Canada Optics, the Bailey Fund, RBC Tech for Nature, and the TD Friends of the Environment Foundation, who's helping sponsor this weekend's launch. In addition, there are a great many and a growing number of in-kind supporters whose names are listed as well on the Atlas website and on screen. To the six dozen people who have signed up as volunteer regional coordinators or co-coordinators in some cases, we extend our very heartfelt thanks. The regional coordinators are generally the first point of contact for volunteer atlasers. They coordinate efforts regionally. They provide support and review records. It's a huge job. We know and appreciate the tremendous job that all of the RCs are doing and we extend our very warmest thanks. The Atlas, as Mike mentioned, is overseen by a management committee representing the five Atlas partners. In addition, the Atlas is supported by no fewer than 15 committees and working groups relating to all aspects of the project. There are 100 people or thereabouts from partner groups and many additional organizations and agencies serving on these committees, working long hours and doing a mountain of work behind the scenes. Thank you so much to all of those. There's also a lot of staff working on the project in different organizations and agencies. I'm only going to scratch the surface quickly, but I do want to thank a few people specifically who are intimately involved in getting the project launched. 
Many of my Birds Canada colleagues are deeply involved. Mike has acknowledged Kaylin already. She's doing an outstanding job as Assistant Atlas Coordinator. And I should mention, she's been doing double duty this past year, uh, leading our aerial insectivore program. Thanks also to Andrew Couturier, Dean Evans, Andrew Marquez, Denis Lepage, Catherine Jardine, Ruth French Keller, Kathy Jones, and Dasha Barlow at Birds Canada, to name just a few of my colleagues. At Ontario Nature, special thanks to Julie Bowen, Emma Horrigan, Ann Bell, John Hassel, and Noah Cole. Special thanks to stellar OFO volunteers, Lynn Freeman and Ian Shanahan. And merci beaucoup to Roxanne Fillion, to Miskaming RC for her leadership in supporting, supporting our Atlasing en Francais. In Présentation en Francais, suivra bientôt. Many thanks to Kevin Middle, Mike Burrell, and Peter Carter of MNRF. And at CWS, special thanks to Russ Weaver, Charles Francis, Jack Hughes, Rich Russell, David Hope, and Kevin Hanna. And of course, it's my pleasure to extend special thanks to our Atlas coordinator, Mike Cadman, a colleague and friend of mine for many years who now leads us in the third Atlas. Mike is a songbird biologist with the Canadian Wildlife Service. He has decades of experience working in ornithology and conservation with a specialty in leading and coordinating multiple bird monitoring programs. He was coordinator of both the first and second Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas projects and lead editor of both the first and second Atlas publications. It's an honor and privilege to have him coordinating, coordinating OPBA3. Well, that's a lot of people and organizations and agencies to thank, but I really tip my hat. It's a huge undertaking. Uh, but we're off on good footing and ex it's exciting to be at this stage once again. I guess it goes without saying that we're embarking on this Atlas journey in challenging and in fact unprecedented times. A global pandemic has touched everyone and we're saddened by lives lost, countless people seriously sickened and so many lives upended. There's light and appearance at the end of the tunnel, but there's still a long way to go. The Atlas Partners and Management Committee are following the situation closely, and the simplest and most important advice we can share is just strict, simply to follow all public health guidelines and stay safe. We've updated a COVID-19 statement to reflect the current stay-at-home order, and we will continue to monitor and update this and post it on the web website. Thankfully, we're in early days of the project, and hopefully that light at the end of the tunnel stays strong and brightens and life and burning can come back to normal soon. Well, we may not know exactly what's around the corner in that regard, but the birds are continuing to return and many are already breeding. We will successfully complete Ontario's third breeding bird atlas successfully, and, <clears throat> and we're grateful to have five years to do it. Uh, before passing this back uh, to Kaylin, I especially want to thank all of you here today and indeed all Atlasers. Thank you for your interest, your enthusiasm, your time and support, and also your patience uh, as we launch OBBA3. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you very much, Gregor. And yes, thank you everyone who participates. It, it, we definitely wouldn't be able to do it without you. Um, before we start on the 2 p.m. Uh, introduction to Atlasing, um, I did just want to go through a few housekeeping items. Um, if you have any technical issues, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, if you have any questions for presenters, then do put that in the Q&A so that we can be sure to answer them. Um, if you are staying for multiple sessions, then this link will be live the entire time. You can either just remain in the Zoom window throughout, or uh, if you do close it, you can log back in using the exact same link. Uh, so those are kind of the, the housekeeping items. There is a French version of the introduction to Atlasing that will be going on. Uh, it is in a different link. I can share that link in the chat. Um, if you've registered for the French, um, if, if you registered for the French version of the, the presentation, then you should have gotten a link as well, but for those uh, who potentially didn't register or are missing their link, then um, I'll post this one in the chat here. Admin, thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Kaylin. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Kathy Jones, and I am looking at the technical end of things on the next session, which is the introduction to Atlasing. 
Um, and I am a volunteer manager at Birds Canada, and I'm quite delighted to be here. So let me start by introducing our, our, our speaker, Mike Hadman, as Kaylin already went through all the, the housekeeping stuff. Um, much of Mike's professional career has been uh, devoted to the Beardy Bird Atlases. He coordinated Ontario's two Atlas projects, 1981 to 1985, and 2001 to 2005. He co-edited the resulting books, and in what sometimes has got to feel like Groundhog Day to him, he is coordinating Atlas Three. So without any further ado, please welcome Mike. Thanks very much, Kathy, appreciate it. Uh, I'm just gonna jump and share my screen right away and jump right into slides because there's a lot of material to try and cover in the next little while. Okay, good. Right presentation. We're on the way. I just need to open that up. Can you see that? Okay. That looks good, Mike. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. I appreciate your coming today. I just want to say a quick um, a recognition that uh, Roxanne Filion, at the same time I'm giving this presentation in, in English, is giving a presentation in French and a different link for that. And uh, if you need to, if you do want to move to over there, put a note in the in the chat, and uh, Kaylin can tell you how to how to do that. So um, you've already heard just recently the five sponsors. So I'll. I jump on from there right into um, what it is the project is all about. And on one hand, we're essentially taking stock of all the birds in the province. Um, we're, the goal is an atlas, so we're trying to determine and map the distribution of the, uh, of, uh, and the relative abundance of the birds of the province in this period 2021 to 25. And we want to, of course, compare that results to previous atlases and set the best uh, base we can for comparison to future atlases. We want to determine the population size, which is much more important in recent years than it uh, has been in the past, and compare that to the previous atlases. We want to get as much information as we can on the significant species and where they're located and their current status. And we want to expand coverage in the north um, to uh, the greatest extent that we can. And this is all about, of course, creating the biggest database and the best database we can for research and conservation purposes so people can look into the effects of climate change and forestry and land use changes that are going on that uh, are undoubtedly affecting our birds. But uh, the Atlas is, to put it briefly, it's an all hands on deck, no holds barred, pull out all the stops, science-based inventory of the birds of the province powered by Ontario's birding community. I will say it's just about the most useful thing you can do as a birder, and it is really an enjoyable thing. If you're new to atlasing, I hope you'll find it uh, as enjoyable as the rest of us have for the, for the past couple of rounds. It's really a fun thing to be doing. Uh, the way the project works is we've divided the province up into regions. Um, Regions are basically around counties. Of course, our square boundaries don't match up with the uh, municipal boundaries, but roughly um, we try and include the, uh, most of the counties in separate regions. And we have a large, uh, as large a town as we can in, uh, in most of those regions. So we have a center of our operations for our regional coordinators to work out of. And our regional coordinators are absolutely key to the project. Um, encourage you, first thing you should do if you want to get involved in the project is go to the website, find out who your regional coordinator is, and uh, contact them, talk to them, uh, talk to them about the project and, and how, you can, uh, how you can fit in. I should say, I, I think it was mentioned earlier, right? we actually have 47 regions, so there's, there's a large number of them uh, spread right across the province and greatly appreciative of their efforts. So, of course, the basis of coverage is the 10 by 10 kilometer square, and our goal is to cover uh, a great number of these. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit deep, uh, in more detail later exactly how those uh, goals are distributed across the province. But we've now provided maps for every square in southern Ontario, and we're uh, close to having the maps for northern Ontario ready. And these maps now are a new version. If you worked on last Atlas, you'll find this a new version has different information on it, a lot more emphasis on habitats on this map. Um, if you look on the right hand side of the map here, you can see the breakdown of the habitats, uh, the legend there. The numbers in each of those uh, little boxes, the little colored boxes, 
are actually the proportion of the habitat that's made up by each of those habitat classes in that square. And so um, a really helpful guideline as to where you should be spending your effort to find all the birds. The map uh, uh, it's, uh, itself, of course, is really wonderful for that. You just um, spend some time figuring out how you're going to get to all these places you want to get to in the square, and then just set about covering the, the various habitats that are available, uh, available in that square. Uh, the numbered points on here are point counts, and I will come back to that and tell you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. So when it comes to those squares, our goals for coverage for each one of them is that we want to find, uh, get at least 20 hours of atlas work in the peak of the breeding season. And the peak of the breeding season in Southern Ontario, we're defining as May 24th to July 10th. And then in the Northern part of the province, basically from about Tomogamy on up from June 1st until July 10th. So 20 hours in the core of the breeding season, you can put as many hours uh, as you like in before that, and we'd really love it if you do. Um, but the, um, the core hours are gonna be those in, the, in that center of the breeding season. And uh, also we wanna get 25 point counts done in those. And again, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about what the point counts are all about. In each of the squares though, we're also hoping to get special surveys done um, because a lot of the birds or certain groups of the birds are very hard to find during regular atlasing or less likely to be come upon. Owls, night jars, and marsh birds are in there and we will be talking more about, uh, about that and encouraging people to get out and be doing uh, these special surveys for these birds. There, there is a, a session later on today about uh, advanced atlasing and the, that will include a session on, on marsh birds. So this time, uh, when it came to Atlas II, I should say that we just really collected data on the basis of that 10 by 10 kilometer square. Was the record inside or outside of that 10 by 10 kilometer square? With this Atlas, and, and based on the work that eBird has done ahead of us, um, we're now basing information on checklists and they're spatially explicit checklists, which basically means you lay down a track either with an app, and I'll talk more about the app, or you can go onto the website after the fact and map out a track for a particular checklist. And then you enter your data to it so that we have that list of birds, the number of birds and the breeding evidence, the highest breeding evidence that you found on that checklist attached to that route. And of course, that's really a major step up on data we've had for previous atlases. That's gonna allow us much more to get a better idea of the population of birds and their associations to habitats. So you can do a track like the one at the top right here where you travel along a road. You can do a stationary point where you stand at one location for uh, as long as you like and uh, record the data there. Or you can do a track through a, a natural area. And this is one thing we're emphasizing, of course, in Atlas Three. We do want people to um, spend time in the natural areas as best they can in uh, provincial parks, national parks, conservation areas. Collect separate checklists within those uh, natural areas, and that's going to give us a, a, an indication uh, But when the data is all in and we can analyze it, how important those protected our areas are to the conservation of birds in the province. So really encourage you to, uh, if you are going to those areas, restrict your checklist to the uh, either inside or outside of that protected areas to help us in that, that analysis. A new feature for this atlas, which is really going to make a big difference, is that um, both on the app and the website, you can uh, pinpoint specific records. So in this case, uh, my track is along the river there. I went for a walk, but I looked across the field and there was a snipe sitting on a post sniper unusual in this area. So I can now um, either on the website, click on it and provide information on that particular record, or um, I can do the same thing on the app, which of course is real. Um, a real advantage. Now, I mentioned collecting information on breeding evidence a number of times, and um, here's, here's the detail. Won't get, you won't have to read all of this. This all, information is all on the website, of course, and you can get the detailed breakdown of how breeding evidence works. But these are um, sort of internationally approved uh, criteria that have been used for the past 50 or 60 years around the world um, for atlasing purposes. They get tweaked a little bit now and again, but they're, they're pretty much standardized everywhere. And it's really all about uh, collecting information that indicates 
the strength of the evidence on uh, that the birds are actually breeding at a particular location. So um, to start off with, the first thing, the first category isn't really breeding evidence at all. This is species that are observed in the breeding season, um, but there's no evidence of breeding. So in this case, this is an Iceland gull. Uh, gulls like this uh, sometimes hang around in the summertime or at least into the beginning of the breeding season. Um, that bird, we know it nests in the Arctic and it, it's, uh, it's not in its breeding habitat here. So that would just be an X. And so um, gulls that you see feeding in fields and that kind of thing, those are, those are just listed as X. And the same with um, if you see a, a yellow legs down in Southern Ontario in June, it, it, it's uh, just a late migrant coming through or, uh, or an early one from its uh, breeding season. And those birds just get reported as X. Now, then we jump up into the possible breeders. So the top two birds here, the common yellow throat on the left and the pied bill grebe, they're in their nesting habitat in the breeding season, so they're considered possible breeders. The birds at the bottom, the bobolink and the white-throated sparrow, are singing in their breeding season in their suitable nesting habitat, so those are also possible breeders, but they get a slightly different code that we note them as singing birds. Now, if we go back a week later and that yellow throat is still there in that location, that white throat is still singing away in that location, those birds are defending territories and we can classify those birds as probable breeders. Um, other ways of looking at probable breeding would be things like these wax wings um, doing a courtship feeding here or a pair of birds in their breeding season in breeding habitat would be considered um, would be considered probable breeders. And there are other categories, but you can, you can look on the website to get the full list of them. And then of course, we're ultimately hoping to confirm breeding in as many species as possible. So obviously if you find a nest with eggs, that's great confirmation. If you can find a, a wood thrush nest with cowbird eggs in it, you can confirm two birds in, in one uh, fell swoop there. But you can also uh, confirm breeding through things like the uh, great crested flycatcher at the top right, carrying food for young. It's gathered up this food, it's gonna to fly to a nest and feed the young. Um, th that fact alone is good enough for you to record that bird as a, as a confirmed breeder in that square. And then of course, obviously, if you see a loon on sitting on a nest, you can confirm nesting that way. Or if you find birds with um, newly fledged young out of the nest, that's another easy way to confirm breeding. Um, things like, uh, uh, distraction displays that killdeers do, they also count as, uh, as confirmed breeding, and an easy way to confirm that species. So there are um, three different ways of submitting your data. Um, first one is, I'll, I'll mention here is the app. So uh, Nature Counts from Birds Can Studies Canada, or Birds Canada, I should say, has um, developed a new app for atlasing purposes. Uh, a new version just got released in the last couple of days. And um, so what we're recommending, there has been a test version out and some pe people have been using it. Um, it. It's had some issues. And so this new version has had a lot of those issues um, ironed out. And we're encouraging everybody to um, uninstall their old version and install the new one and um, proceed with uh, using it for data collection. Um, if, you, if you're not into apps and not everybody wants to be looking at a phone and entering data on a tiny little phone, um, you can just enter the data any way you, that works uh, for you. Record the data that is on paper or in a notebook or a checklist form. You can print a, a checklist off the data form uh, off the website and then go to the website and enter the data right on there. You can also enter data from eBird. If you um, do a, an eBird checklist, there's a simple way of transferring um, the data from the eBird checklist into Nature Counts and uh, more information on that on the website. But it's really a very simple thing to do. I should also mention while we're talking about eBird that um, you can specify that, your, that you want your data that you're entering to the Atlas from Nature Counts to go into eBird and it will be automatically transferred um, as soon as you enter the data into the, into the um, project. So here's what the app looks like to some extent. On the right side there, um, you can see uh, on this particular checklist, I, I went out and found four um, Canada geese. The highest evidence I got of breeding was fledged young, which is confirmation, which is great. And you can see on down the list there. Um, 
when you're on the app and you want to enter breeding evidence, you just tap on that breeding evidence column next to the bird's name and up will pop the um, little keypad on the bottom left there that lists all of those breeding evidences and the, the likelihood or the, any, any issues that there are with those codes for, um, for that species. So, you know, if, if uh, say you have a cowbird, then this will pop up and the, um, the code for um, carrying food for young, for example, wouldn't be lit up. It would be lit up with a caution saying, you know, uh, cowbirds don't feed young, so you wouldn't be expecting to use that code for that species. And this, that guide, I think, is really, really helpful in, in uh, ensuring that the data that we get is, uh, is clean and, uh, and, and free of those kind of worries. And in the end, with the breeding evidence data, this is what we get, uh, a map like this, where we can see the occurrence of the species, which squares it was in, um, which blocks it was in on the, uh, on the provincial scale at the bottom right there. We do uh, collect data by 10 kilometer squares in the north as well, and it is feasible to uh, look more closely at the, uh, at the squares in the north. Um, I also mentioned on this map that those yellow dots show um, squares that the species was reported in in the second atlas, but not in the first. And so the yellow dots show the expansion of the range of the yellow rump warbler, in this case, um, into southern Ontario, south of the Canadian Shield, between atlases. And we found that for quite a lot of species that breed in mature conifer forests, that a lot of the pine plantations in the southern Ontario have matured over time, and now we're starting to um, take on um, uh, populations of birds that would previously have nested further north. I should mention these four letter codes. I will come back to them because um, they come in quite handy. Um, I won't use them more than I have to, but I use them a few places in here because I'm gonna recommend that you uh, take some time and learn those four letter codes because they're very useful for entering data quickly. Okay, so I wanna talk about the point counts too. And the point counts, the main intention behind the point counts is to give us an indication of the uh, relative abundance of the species in the square. So in each of these squares, there are 40 numbered locations on roadsides. And your goal as the atlaser um, is to cover at least 20 of those. And I should say that uh, this job, the, I'll go into more detail about it, but there's two types of point counts. One you have to be an expert birder for and one you don't. So if you know your birds well by sound, um, you can do regular point counts where you just go out and listen for birds for five minutes, um, record all the, um, all the birds that you see and, and enter that information. Uh, as well as those um, on-road points, each square has been analyzed individually to indicate how well that roadside layer represents the habitats in the square. And then each square has a customized um, a set of off-road points that uh, are meant to improve the overall habitat representation in that square. So I've circled there on the map um, the four, um, the fact that um, we're looking for four off-road points in broadleaf forest and one in a mixed forest in this particular square. And each square will have its own, again, customized to the habitat situation in that square. I should mention also um, that for one thing, there's, I'm gonna talk in more detail about point counts later on this afternoon. Um, and secondly, that you'll notice there's points A and B in red there. I don't know if you can see my cursor, A, uh, B and A, but those are points that were done off-road in Atlas II. And so it's advantageous, of course, if we can get those same points visited again. And so we've made those locations available and encourage, encourage point counters to go out and do those. So when you're doing a point count, you're doing it for five minutes, but you actually divide the time slot into two periods, uh, one to three minutes and four to five. So you record all the birds that you hear in the first three minutes, and then you add any new birds, four minutes, four and five. And um, the idea behind this, of course, is to, uh, one, it gives us an indication of the likelihood that you're detecting birds in that particular point. And secondly, the three minutes is the standard length of a breeding bird survey, which is another ongoing survey across the country. And um, by having this parallel in the atlas, it allows us to incorporate data from the breeding bird survey right into the atlas, which is gonna be very useful in terms of including coverage. 
So again, it's the same kind of thing. You can do this on the app, like in this case, or you can do it in various other forms. Um, just if you are going to do it in a notebook, I'd recommend buying a notebook that's got columns in it, and it makes it much easier to just organize your point count. Again, you'll see a lot of four letter codes here that uh, just really simplify recording the data. It's quite a simple thing once you get the hang of it, but um, you need to spend a little time learning those. Um, okay. The other option, just if you prefer, you can um, and, uh, uh, collect information on these point counts using distance bands as well. We're not thinking everybody will go for this, but if you are interested in doing it, we would encourage you to give it a go. Um, you record birds not only in what time bands they're in, but at what distance they are away from you. Are they less than 50 meters, 50 to 100, or greater than 100 meters? And of course, this information is really uh, beneficial in giving us much more information on the density of birds, and that's going to help um, in our population estimates. So you're not required to do point counts this way, um, but if you are interested, um, it would be uh, of great benefit. And you, of course, you can do that in your notebook as well. Uh, we are setting up the app, so you'll be able to do that on the app. It's not, it's not quite ready yet, um, but um, the point counts don't start until May 24th, so we have a few weeks to, to get, that, get that organized. Okay, I mentioned those four letter codes and would encourage you to um, have a look at those. They are uh, gonna be on the website quite soon, but there's quite a simple set of rules for how you get these four letter codes. In the case of a bird that just has one name, so in this case, the Anhinga, which you'd be very lucky to find in Ontario, if it's just got one word in its name, you just use the four, first four letters. If it's got two names, like the American Red Star, you use the first two letters from each of those names. If it's got three, uh, three words, you use the first, the first, and then the first two. And if it's got four, you just use the first le uh, letter of each of the words in the name. And um, that way, almost all the birds in the province have a unique code. There's a few that cause a little challenge, um, but you'll, you'll soon twig to what those are. And uh, there are simple rules to get around those, those uh, for those few species. Now, I mentioned how there's a second kind of point count that you can do. If you don't know birds well enough by song to do a point count, um, we are encouraging people to do them using um, these Zoom units. We've purchased a number of these Zoom units, provided them to regional coordinators, and they're going to loan them out to atlasers for point count purposes. I should say um, we're primarily um, interested in getting these done in squares where people aren't doing um, regular point counts. So that's probably going to be largely a little further north in the province, but um, we uh, would also appreciate getting some of these type of point counts done further south. Um, again, it's just a matter of um, setting up the device and there's instructions on how to set it up and then heading out into the field, going to those predetermined point count locations, um, standing there for five minutes, pressing play, and um, it will record all the sounds of all the birds it sees, uh, it sees that it hears around. And um, then that information, when you're done at the end of the day or when you've got your um, however many points counts you're going to do completed, you can then uh, go home, um, download that information um, to the computer, and um, it will then go into a system that allows um, it, this wild track system that mentioned on here that allows experts to actually sit and listen to those recordings and uh, extract the, the bird data from them. So, um, and I should, at the bottom, it talks about crowdsourcing. We are going to be encouraging uh, atlasers who can identify birds by song well to actually uh, sit and listen to these recordings. And you can do this in the middle of winter while having a coffee. Uh, to in, in the comfort of your living room, actually be doing point counts from the boreal forest or Algonquin Park or something else like that. And we're going to be setting up a process over the next couple of weeks that you can uh, start to start to do that and collect that information. So these are the kind of maps that you get from um, from point counts. And as you can see, you can contour and smooth out information to, to give you uh, the uh, clear indication of the pattern of the numbers of birds. Now here's these four letter codes again. Um, just mentioned those, the yellow rump warbler, the black Bernian war, uh, warbler, 
um, which is the BLBW. It's one of the ones that has uh, uh, a conflict with another, it conflicts with the black pole warbler, the northern rough wing swallow, and the Wilson snipe. But you can see there just how some of the species are highly different numbers in different parts of the province. And the one that always blows me away is the, the snipe, reasonably common bird in much of the province. You can see the concentration in Eastern Ontario. But then when you look at the Hudson Bay lowlands, uh, you can just see the red all lit up there, that uh, this is a species that's uh, in far greater density up there in the far north than it is down here in the Southern part of the province. So um, point count's gonna be an important part of the project and, and I encourage you to uh, help us out with those. Okay, um, the, this atlas is going to not only involve a lot of uh, volunteers, but we also are incorporating what are called autonomous recording units. These are primarily gonna be used in the North. And the idea is that they can complement the work that the atlases are doing in the field. So when it comes to the Northern work then, um, maybe I should say a little bit more about the ARUs when I'm thinking about it. Um, the idea of these is they allow you to, um, you can strap one to a tree, you can, uh, they have uh, big batteries in them. So you can set them up in, in the spring or even in the winter uh, and program them to start recording uh, during the breeding season. And we usually record them for say a session in the morning, a session in the evening and then at night so we can get the nocturnal species. Go back and pick them up six months later and download that data, enter them into that wild track system and uh, people can start listening to those and extracting the information from them. So when it comes to the work in the north, um, again, if you attend the, the a session on advanced atlasing this afternoon, it'll talk uh, more about this, but our intention, first intention in the, in the north is to repeat the squares that were done in Atlas II or that were well covered right up to the Hudson Bay, uh, Hudson Bay coast. And then we're going to be incorporating a lot of effort from professional biologists and ARUs to fill in the gaps between uh, the work that the atlases are able to do right across the north. And so uh, here's a bit more detail, the, the squares that have been identified from Atlas II, you can see the breakdown of how we got into these various squares last time. And um, we're going to be wanting to repeat all of that work. So if, you're, if you are um, interested in work in the North, again, there's more detail on this uh, at this afternoon's session, but um, we'd very much encourage you to, to start signing up for this. We can't do this work in 2021 with COVID, but we are hoping to really gear up in 2022 and get caught up and, and get a lot of these squares done. A lot of the work's done on rivers, so if you're a canoeist, if you're outdoor survival skills and um, know your northern birds, we uh, would very much encourage you to get involved in some of this, some wonderful adventures to be had. And I mentioned the, the ARU work and um, the other um, sampling that's going to be done by professional biologists right across the province complementing the Atlas work. This is, this is an initial design on how that whole thing is going to be set up. Um, in this case, based on the ecological regions in the, in the far north. So there's loads of us out there. We want to get as many of you as possible involved this time in, in as many different ways as we can. Um, there are already a lot of squares assigned to pri uh, primary or principal atlases for a square. And we want to try and uh, make clear this, how this relationship works. So a principal atlaser has really taken on responsibility for ensuring that a square gets adequately covered, that it gets that 20 hours of atlasing, it gets the 25 point counts, and um, has first dibs at checking to see if there are any, um, well, at doing any of the uh, special surveys that uh, we want to get done in those squares. The rest of the folks, which is another, probably 80% of the atlases out there, aren't going to be principal atlases for a particular square, although we would encourage you to take on squares outside your own region if you can see squares that are available. Um, but really, you're not tied to any one particular square and we want you to be thinking more broadly. You can work in any square, but feel free to um, take on one of the squares. It might already have a principal atlaser involved. Really, it, it doesn't matter. That person's there to help make sure that things get wrapped up. Um, you can work away in any square that you're that uh, it works for you. 
Um, again, trying to get those, those uh, at least 20 hours of atlasing. And if you can be talking to a regional coordinator, you may find there are squares where point counts need done. And um, we'd very much appreciate your help getting that done. The goal as a freelancer is you're really trying to find um, not only every species in the square, but really we're trying to find every species in every square in the whole region. So there's a, a, a role for folks that uh, aren't tied to any one particular square to help with that. Um, we wanna maximize the breeding evidence for as many species as we can in those squares. But we um, really, if you wanna help the atlas in the uh, most effective way, it's a matter of finding the areas that are being poorly covered and targeting those. And uh, that's where we'd most appreciate your efforts. Of course, appreciate your efforts anywhere you wanna collect data, but uh, to, to be maximally useful, filling in those gaps is, uh, is gonna be a big priority. Already you can go on the coverage map and see squares that aren't uh, even assigned to an atlas or yet. So good options there for places to uh, target your effort right off the bat. And of course, special surveys, talk to regional coordinators about possibilities there. Um, there's, there's lots of opportunities to get involved in the special surveys. Um, so how do you go about finding all the species in a square? Well, uh, if you go on the website, there's something called a square summary sheet. You can find um, links to fairly, fairly readily. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of one in a minute. And so I won't go into that quite yet, but um, one thing you might do then is learn from that uh, square summary sheet which species have been reported in that square historically and, and start thinking about how you're going to find some of those. Um, it's really good to focus on trying to find the rare and elusive and poorly known birds. The rest of them, the, the robins and the red winged blackbirds and that kind of thing, will come out just in your searching for these other species. Um, and another thing to think about is to target your efforts appropriately for the season. So right now, before the bulk of the uh, neotropical migrants are back, good opportunities to go out and, and uh, nail down the nuthatches and the, the woodpeckers and the raptors that are nesting uh, before all the leaves are out. And before they, a lot of those birds get very quiet once they're well into the breeding season, can be very hard to find in June. So target your efforts um, for the species that are active um, in this early part of the year. Um, of course, you want to be finding the best habitats in the square. In the square, so look at the map, find out where the marshes, all the different kinds of wetlands are. Think about ways that you can access them. Um, the riparian areas are particularly rich. Look for the largest habitat patches you can find, and figure out ways of of getting into those um, forests, but also grassland, shrubs in particular. Fields of shrubs are very, very rich locations. Um, I, I call them hawthorn meadows, but play, places you often see old pastures that have grown up with hawthorns, shrubs uh, dotted around them are often really rich places and well worth concentrating on. And of course, plantations, uh, conifer plantations are rich locations for a lot of species that aren't found in, in other habitats. And don't always uh, concentrate on one age of these habitats. Look for younger ones and older ones. Each of these has species that are special to them and um, you'll maximize your efficiency by visiting the greatest variety of habitat types and habitat ages that you can. If you go onto eBird or if you go onto the Atlas website uh, and you look under the um, tools and resources, you can go and look and find eBird hotspots that are in your square. And those are gonna probably be places where people do a lot of birding. So they are gonna be rich places you wanna make sure get, get covered. And as I mentioned previously, parks and protected areas are, are obviously gonna be uh, rich and useful places to get to, especially for off-road point counts. If you're looking for spots to do uh, points in the middle of a forest, often the parks are uh, beneficial that way. Uh, look early for trails and areas that you can get to within the square. Um, we have got a, a landowner letter that's, um, I don't think it's quite on the website yet, but will be very soon. You can print these off. You can either customize it to yourself off the website or just write in your information uh, yourself carry those with you. And then if you get to a site that you'd like to get at, you can see that maybe there's a really nice wetland you'd like to get into or a forest tract you'd like to visit. Um, put the um, landowner letter in the mailbox of the rural landowner and uh, with your contact info, have them contact you. And um, if they're interested in having you go on there and we found in the past that's worked quite successfully to get in some really special areas. 
and of course, this time of year, um, before everything is back, is a good time to be working on and refreshing your knowledge of birdsong. Um, we recommend highly Dendroica. Um, seen here, there's information on this on the website under the Learning Resources tabs, and um, would really encourage you to be doing everything you can uh, to learn your birds as quickly as possible. It, it's great this time of year before the great mass of birds come back, try and nail down what the common local birds are now so that you're more um, open to the, the, uh, the new ones when they arrive in the next, uh, next month or two. So here's the square summary sheet. Um, the information and in, you see next to the Canada goose there, the FY, that is the fledged young that was reported in that, um, in that square. That's the, the highest evidence that was reported in that square in uh, the previous atlas. And then this, the sheet, all of the species listed in here, so you'll notice mute swan and trumpeter swan don't have codes next to them. Those species were reported in this region, in this atlas region, but not in that atlas square. So they're good to give you an idea of which birds are liable to be nesting locally, if not having been found in that particular square last year. And I could say I, I've already been out to my square a couple of times. I've already got trumpeter swans uh, nesting in my square, which is, is wonderful to have. Um, you can see across the top there it, uh, in blue, about the target point counts in that, uh, in that square, that same information is provided, provided there as well. Uh, the percentages are just the percentage of squares that the bird has been reported in to this point during Atlas three. So those will change uh, rapidly over time, but it, it pretty soon becomes clear which are the common birds that obviously reported in the great majority of those squares. And this is really just, uh, I encourage you to go out and mark on your maps. I encourage you to print off a copy of your map, mark it up, um, mark all the places you want to get to, mark birds are, are especially um, interesting, you want to go back and, and check on or sites that uh, are, are well worth visiting. Um, there are safe date uh, um, documents on the website. Again, I encourage you to have a look at those. They help you distinguish which species are um, breeding now and will be starting to breed later. And so we can um, make sure you concentrate your um, recordings into the appropriate time of year for that, for each species. Um, Mike Burrell is going to be talking later this afternoon about um, how to use these safe date um, uh, charts. Um, of course, if you get information on rare species, we do want you to document them. In particular, look for their little uh, markings, the, the, uh, the plus sign there, um, indicating provincially rare or species at risk, um, uh, designated species. And those ones we really would want to get um, good details on. We want to make sure that those are well documented, both as to how you identified the bird, but also uh, what it was doing and, and what the situation was where you found it. Um, birds of special interest, these are, some of these are species at risk that are um, quite common, things like barn swallows and that kind of thing, um, are still of interest. Um, we do want to get a certain amount of documentation on those, um, especially if you find confirmed breeding. And then uh, there are species listed on your data forms as being regionally rare and um, would want you very much to, to document those species as you go. So um, wrapping it up here, we have done this twice now. Uh, this is Glen Cody fording a stream up on the Hudson Bay lowlands in an earlier atlas. And um, while it, this is in June, but the snow was still on the ground, but our, uh, our rapid, rabidly enthusiastic atlases are out there um, covering the whole province. And uh, we look forward to, to working with you and doing this again. Uh, we think this atlas can be the best one yet and hope you'll work with us to help make it so. Um, I want to say thanks to these folks um, who've, uh, who are supporting the Atlas, either financially or in kind. They've been uh, really great so far, and uh, their help is really appreciated. Um, you probably know our website by now, but uh, information on the website there, we do have uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter accounts as well to try and get information out to people. Um, get back to us if you have any questions or in particular get hold of your regional coordinator and, uh, and uh, we can help deal with any questions you might have about the project. So I'd 
Kathy, can I hand things back to you? And Absolutely. Um, thank you so them. much, Mike. Um, that was great. And we had a lot of interest in the questions. So we will not get to all of them. I apologize in advance for that. I would like to say there was some app questions about reading codes and dates. Um, that is the next session, which is at, oops, let me see here, 3 to 3.30. So anybody has questions about that should go to the next session. There was a lot of technical questions. So I'm pushing those aside because Kaylin is doing a presentation tomorrow on, ants, on the different mechanisms to ants, um, enter data. So that would be the place to go. Plus there's the appendices online and Kaylin has a wonderful collection of um, um, tutorials and videos that she's put online that you can use as well. But let's just see if we can get some of the questions answered. And there was a lot of them. Um, okay, now the first one, I think you and I have discussed this before, so I'm looking forward to your answer, Mike. The whole idea when you're entering your data for the Atlas, do you put in all bird observations or only the ones that you can attach a breeding code to? Right. Yeah, put in everything. Um, the app's designed, um, it, the, it, it's easy to enter data for every species and just um, tap on the, the breeding evidence column to add breeding evidence for the ones that, uh, for which it's appropriate. But we are interested in uh, keeping track of what other birds are around at that time. So Mike, for the next couple, do you mind going back to that lovely slide you had that had the freelancer and the different atlas oh, yeah. types on it? Okay. And the, several of the questions relate to, um, let me see if I can find them here. Um, uh, if they sign up for one region, can they sign up for multiple regions? And I believe the answer for that is yes. Um, they just do that online, right? Yes, yeah, you could just, uh, yes. And just really, it's a matter of contacting the regional coordinator and, and letting them know that you're interested. And if they want to be um, an primary square atlas or it's the same thing, correct? They contact the regional coordinator? Yes, absolutely. Okay, on the same token, there's a question about um, what if they is overlap between a freelancer and a primary square um, atlas? How is that handled? Well, it, it's, it's just handled um, really from the point of view that both are welcome to be working in there. So um, if you want to, uh, if you know who the principal atlaser is, you could chat with them and, and work out if you're going to uh, take a different part of the square or how, you, how you're going to arrange that. Or you could just go ahead and work in the square. Really, it's all independent. The, um, the principal atlaser will just look at what data is being collected and ensure you know, they, they were probably going to know the square better than most people. And they'll figure out what's missing and, and uh, try and try and fill in those gaps. Cool, cool. Now the next one, we have several with the same pattern. Is it 20 uh, hours per volunteer or 20 hours for the square overall? Um, and related to that, they're wondering how many times they can go back to the same point counts. Like if, if I recall correctly, you're pretty much trying to get every species. So the whole goal there is when you think you have enough species, you're done. Do I understand that correctly? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, um, we, we, we had to come up with a, with a standard criteria for what, when we would consider a square adequately covered. And, and so that was based on actually work from the first atlas and uh, work from the Brits ahead of us. And we worked out that 20 hours by an experienced birder in the peak season is enough to get 75 to 80% of the species that breed in a square. And so we set that as sort of a minimum goal. Now, in reality, in Southern Ontario, in Atlas II, we got over 50 hours per square that, were, that, were, um, that was done in the way of coverage. So um, the 20 hours, it is sort of a minimum standard and uh, don't feel by any way, uh, in any way constricted by that. Uh, as Kathy said, the goal is really to find every bird that's nesting in those squares. And uh, it can take a lot more hours than 20 to find the last few of those. And so uh, I would encourage people to, uh, to be doing that in areas where we can afford it. Um, like up further north, um, we more encourage people to get, if, uh, if there's lots of empty squares, to get your 20 hours in, in the peak season and then move on to another square, just because um, it better, to, better for everyone if we can get those, uh, get all the squares up to a minimum standard rather than having a few very well covered and a, a lot of big gaps. So, so one person suggested that 
for one point location, recording um, a list for different times of day would be a good idea. Would that be the best way to approach ensuring you get all the birds on that point count? And can they just do one point count alone? Yeah, um, the point, what, again, the requirement is that point counts only get done once and only done once during, at, at any time over the five years of the project and get done in that, in that peak breeding season. And um, you'll, when you, we're just about to put the point manual, uh, the point count manual online, you'll get the details on this, but they are um, done at, uh, in the early hours of, of the day. And so, yeah, it's only, only necessary to do each point once. Um, if you, we've already had people that I, I noticed on the website the other day, something like 170 point counts have already been done, which is kind of amazing considering we don't have a manual yet or the rules haven't been laid out, but people are uh, dying to get on with them. Um, they, they can't do official point counts um, uh, until May 24th, but the point counts that have been done and any points that are done ahead, um, we can use that information and basically they'll be used as five minute checklists. Um, at least, and I, I don't know until we start analyzing the data and looking uh, more in depth, that there may be other ways of also using that data. But at this point, um, I can't really say, but we can say at least they'll be used as five minute checklists. Okay, now there's a couple other things. A lot of it's about how to get a hold of their regional coordinator. And I recommend that when you go to the birdsontario.org website, you will find there's links there that show all the Atlas squares in the map and you can figure out who you are and who your coordinator is. And you can sign up through them there or get their contact information. So that's the place for those things. Now there's another question. Is this is Sarah, she's sort of joking, but I think she has a valid point. We're in a pandemic, we're basically losing a lot of this year. Are we concerned? Do we wanna push things off? Um, how do you feel about that? I'm thinking we have plenty of time. We have five years, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, we have five years and it's, it's a blessing in that respect. And yes, it, it is hurting. Um, obviously people aren't doing as much travel as, as they would be. We're really not going to get nearly as good coverage in central and northern Ontario as we would have in a, in a normal year. Um, it's going to be assessed during the course of the project. If it looks like um, we're falling short of coverage because of what happened in, in 2021, then uh, it's feasible that another year would be added. Um, or, already these discussions are underway in Saskatchewan where they're just finishing up their atlas and in Newfoundland where they're a year ahead of us, that it may be necessary to add another year on. Um, it's early days, we're not really having that serious conversation yet, but uh, uh, as the project progresses, we'll be, we'll be checking to see if we need to do that. If people have a lot of questions about point counts, which is another, theme. Um, the advanced atlasing tomorrow, it's four or at 3.45 today, that should cover a lot of the point count questions, correct? Yes. Okay, so all of you guys are interested in point counts, that's a great place to go. Um, somebody asked about where to get one of the Zoom devices, and related to that, if they record their, on their own using their own system, can they go ahead and translate those into species counts later? Oh, but both, both good questions. The, um, the Zoom units, we have, we purchased uh, uh, 100 or so units and distributed them to our regional coordinators. So regional coordinators each have one or two of those that they can loan out to people for a few days at a time to, to do points. Um, now, the rest of that question was about other alternative types of recording units. Um, it is feasible to use other types of recording units and we're actually going, we're in the process of devising some um, guidelines for those because there are certain minimum standards that are required in the quality of the um, device as a recording device. You can't use your cell phone, for example, um, to record point counts, but um, other dedicated devices like the Zoom can be used. But uh, again, there's certain specifications. So I wouldn't go out and buy a, a buy a unit for this purpose um, until you know more about it. I, some people are, I know are already interested in purchasing their own. And um, if you're going to purchase one for this purpose, buy a Zoom H2N, um, but otherwise I'd hold off if you're interested in another one and checking when we have the specifications on the, on the website. Now we are 
running late and I don't know how appropriate it is for us to continue too long, too much later. We have a lot of questions. But the one question I think we should really cover before we finish is, is it okay to enter your e data just on eBird and transfer it over? Is that is that a reasonable option? It is, it is. And what, um, what are the as trouble, what are the pros and cons to that? Well, the, the, the con is that um, eBird doesn't have uh, some of the same sort of same checks and balances and it has a, a, a number of features missing. Um, it doesn't have that ability to pinpoint specific records and that kind of thing, which the, I have to admit the Atlas app doesn't have at this moment, but is in, in, the, in the process of development. We will have that soon. Um, the, the, I, I mentioned how the Atlas screens or at least prompts you about breeding evidence and make sure that you're careful about recording the right breeding evidence. Uh, that kind of thing is built into the Atlas app, but not into eBird. So when you submit um, an eBird list and you want to transfer that into the Atlas, um, the, uh, the Nature Counts uh, database that, that the Atlas is using will prompt you and say, okay, well, you're missing some information that eBird didn't ask you for, and you are going to have to go through a, a few extra steps just to add in that extra information. It's usually pretty simple to do, um, but um, that's sort of the downside, that it, it becomes a multi-step process to get your eBird list in. Okay, one last question, and then I think we have to say goodbye. Well, there's two. I'm going to answer one. Um, Jenny said, asked if all surveys are done once in every five years, and that's the plan. They have to be done once. Um, another, Jean asked, should freelance atlasers um, do and enter point counts without contacting the regional coordinator first? So that's the last question, and then we're going to say goodbye. Yeah. I much prefer if you contact your regional coordinator and um, and work with them on that. It may be that there are squares where they really need point counts done and that there are already people assigned to do point counts in particular squares and uh, we want to avoid unnecessary duplication. So it would be best if you um, contacted your regional coordinator and, and asked those questions. Okay, well, it's, it's 2.52. It's about eight minutes to the next session. Um, if you'd like to stay on for that next session, which is breeding codes and, oops, let me double check it, and safe dates, feel free. But Doug and I, uh, Mike and I will sign off for now. And thanks everybody for attending. I will answer the questions I can in the next couple minutes. And, um, and then we'll just dismiss the, all the re remaining questions. And I'm sorry, we couldn't get them to all. So thank you everybody for attending. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions.